Hello and welcome to my talk about how to, how to apply AI to testing. Um, AI has been a bit of a, a hype recently and testing is a long-standing uh, problem. So 99% of the respondents uh, of some uh, Gartner um, report said that they have challenge with testing. Test automation is fundamentally uh, required for DevOps and therefore um, Therefore, 50% um, so someone, so the people at Gartner think that 50% uh, of enterprises will leverage intelligent test automation. Testing is essentially the bottleneck in development um, right now. So when you do testing and you want to do tef um, when you do software development and you want to do um, continuous deployment, continuous integration, uh, then testing is, is what hinders you most. And therefore, it's uh, quite natural to say, okay, um, we can use AI, this new shiny technology, and apply it to testing. Well, how does it work? So if you look at the, you know, some software that you don't know about, and I would ask you, is that value correct or not? Then you would probably answer, well, how should you know? <laughs> you have no idea. You don't know the, the software that's being tested. You don't know the data that went in, how it was configured. So how can you know whether this value is correct or not? And frankly, AI is in the exact same situation. So let's just um, think about some logical things. Like if you would say, okay, you want to do a calculation, one minus two, what is the correct outcome of this? Well, mathematically, it would be minus one, right? So if you have a calculator, uh, your software that you, you, that you develop is a calculator, then this would be the correct answer. But it's not the only possible answer. Like if you create a um, Amazon, for instance, and you don't want to pay back gift certificates to the customer, then zero is the correct answer. Or if you're actually working with a calculator, but maybe with something that involves time, then it could be 23 or 59, depending on what, you, what you're working with, hours or minutes or seconds. Um, if it's a, a date time application, a date application, then um, it's something, you know, randomly, more or less, uh, 27 or 30. And if you're working with Kelvin degrees, then it would be even an exception. Right, because it would be an invalid. Uh, it would not be possible to get minus degrees in Kelvin. Um, so the problem is, people. So this is the impression that that um, many people have that um, the software is on the complex side of things, and users are usually. I mean, this is what software development is about, right? Making things more simpler. So um, the user and therefore the manual tester is on the simple side of things, where in an ideal world you have a simple, intuitive, easy-to-use interface. So um, it should be easy to replace the tester with AI, because th this is, frankly, this is all he does, right? Component recognition, so he has to identify a, a field, text field or a button, um, enter some text and, you know, have some easy um, data, like username and password, if you if you think about a login screen. But in order to actually identify a bug, he has to navigate the complexity of the problem. He has to understand what the actual goal of the software is that he's testing. So this is the actual picture. See, so the, the, um, the job of the developer is to formalize the solution into a code, and the job of the tester is to, to check whether that formalization was correct and in order to do that, he has to understand the problem that's behind it. Otherwise, that screen looks perfectly valid. So for those who can't read it, it says password is being used by Rovaldo3789. Please choose another password. Well, if you think about this, uh, this is a major security flaw. But on the first sight, it looks valid, so you have to understand what you're actually doing. You have to understand the problem domain to be able to recognize that this is not correct. So what it's about is finding the bug, identifying the bug. So can anybody spot the bug in there? So that twig actually is not a twig, it's a bug. And this problem is called the Oracle problem. And this hinders, um, this hinders uh, currently to bring AI into testing. Well, let's think about that differently. If you do testing, how do you do testing? 
<clears throat> first you execute the test, so you do something with the software. And then at some point, you make a comparison between something that you um, expected, because you read the documentation, you talked to stakeholders, you, you know, used common sense, whatever. So there's an expected value or state, and there's an actual state. And if they match, if there's no difference, you're done. There's no bug. And um, if there is a difference, if they don't match, then you found a bug, right? Well, not so fast. It could actually be that um, that you made a mistake, that you had a wrong assumption, that you that the the um, specification was outdated, that the common sense was mistaken, um, that it's not intuitive, something like that. So in that case, um, you have to update your expect like your mental state of what the software should do. And there are actually quite uh, funny examples for that. Um, so the question behind that is also, when is a bug not a bug? Well, when it's a feature. And for instance, um, when uh, in um, the early days, when they implemented the Unix file system, all the files, initially all the files were on the same level. And then there were too many of them. So they introduced a hierarchical file system. And in order to be able to navigate that, they implemented the dot and the dot dot operator. It was all command line. So with a, these two operators, you could reference the actual, the current um, hierarchy or the parent hierarchy. And there's um, the, the command ls, list files. And that would show those two um, operators as if they were actual physical files. So they fixed that, they uh, extended the ls command with that line of code. Where they in the loop where they just check whether the first um, character in the name is a dot. And if so, they ignore the file, they, they continue in the loop. But of course, you can rename a regular file to have the first character be a dot. So by accident, they invented hidden files. And that uh, feature was so uh, popular that they never fixed that bug. Now you have ls minus a, show all files, to also show the hidden files, but that was actually not a feature initially. And maybe you know that game, it's called Space Arcade, where you are the little uh, spaceship at the bottom and you shoot at the aliens, and the less aliens there are, the faster the, the game gets. And that also was initially not a feature. So at the time, uh, hardware was slow, and the, the lesser uh, things it needed to render on the screen, the faster it got. And this also became popular among um, testers and players, so they also never fixed that. But it wasn't, initially it wasn't a feature. And you probably know uh, that with Google Mail, you can, if you send an email, you can say undo, ah, damn, I forgot the attachment, or I don't want to, uh, um, you know, switch jobs or something. Um, and that initially also wasn't a feature. So when, with Google, everything is service-oriented. So when they implemented that, they had the problem that there just was a lag between sending, you know, clicking send and actually sending the mail because, uh, I don't know, virus checking and all that stuff that went on behind the scenes. And when they wanted to release that, they just couldn't get rid of the lag. So some clever developer came up with that solution to turn that lag into feature. So now you have five seconds to undo sending the email. And what I want to say with that is, without specifications, there are no bugs, only surprises. So why do we test in the first place? So after an implementation, obviously we test to find bugs, right? So if your um, if your application says one plus one is three. This is actually wrong. And if it says, for instance, 2 plus 2 is 4, uh, this is correct. But um, mostly we are in the situation that we have an existing situation. We are not on the green field where we start new, but we have something already. And maybe we just want to change one functionality, one screen, one feature, one thing. And for all the rest, we just want that to not break, right? We, d we want it to to stay functional, to stay the same. Which means that after a change, if your customer is using this, so if, if that bug 1 plus 1 is 3 was never found and was rolled out and your customer has been using it for five years, 
then this is the correct answer, right? You can't just change that at random. So if, if 1 plus 1 is now 5, which mathematically is just as wrong, so it doesn't matter, but if your customer is used to that, then this is the correct answer and 5 is the wrong answer. So whatever the state is, you just want to make sure that it stays that way. Which means that automated regression testing, t test automation, like 90% of test automation, is not about testing. So we, we should actually we should change the name because it's not testing. We don't want to find bugs like that are there, that we know that are there, that the customer is using and accustomed to. We just want to make sure that the software doesn't change uncontrollably. Which means that version that uh, regression testing is actually not testing but version control. And I, I can't stress that point enough. So, um, actually, if you want to fix that bug at some point and you say, okay, my customer has been using this for, f for five years, but still it's a bug and I want to fix it, um, then you want to do that, but you still want to make sure that all else doesn't break, right? So it's still, it's still version control. Um, which means that whenever you create a test and you create a, a check, an assertion, then what you do is essentially you blacklist a change. You say, okay, this thing that I want to check here can't change without me noticing. And when I notice, I might even decide that this is correct, like, you know, I adapted the software, but at least I want to know. So this can't change without me noticing. So this is um, blacklisting of changes. And instead, you could do also whitelisting of changes, which means that you check everything, and of course, there are th some things that, that can change. Like with a version control with Git, you also have like uh, log, uh, log files and class um, files and stuff that you don't check into version control that you want to ignore. So the, 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 the right balance is probably somewhere in the middle. So um, the question here is how much effort is it for you to create the expected um, value that you want to check. So if you think about a regular test, for instance a Selenium test, you have at some point you have asserts, as I just said, that make sure that something is there, but you, usually you don't check everything. You check just what you care about. Which on the other hand means that if your website looks like that, your test is still green, because you didn't check that. Or you check that but uh, <laughs> this is a nightmare to create and maintain, right? So nobody does that. Um, so usually when we think about that, we probably want to check rather more than less. So it's probably less of effort to start off on the left with a whitelisting approach and ignore changes rather than what we do right now with, with traditional Selenium, start uh, at the, at the um, uh, blacklisting side of changes. Um, and another thing is that you can't check for unforeseen stuff. Like, uh, this is an example from Google, and they had the problem that, so when they make a change, they mark that change to be tested, you know, by manual testers. And they do so by using a unicorn. So um, if you're a tester at Google, you know what you need to check, what you need to test, because it's marked with unicorn. And for some reason, um, they forgot to remove that mark when they released uh, when they released their software. So customers suddenly had unicorns dancing all over the screen. And uh, the reason is um, that their automated tests didn't have a check whether there was a unicorn on the screen, which is obviously something everybody should do, right? Um, so the thing is that if you think about that, um, with whitelisting of changes, like think about configuring a, f a firewall. You wouldn't want to close individual ports with a firewall, right? That just doesn't make sense. You just, your regular thing is you close all the ports and then you just open what you need. And with whitelisting, you err on the side of security. Like if there is something unforeseen, like a unicorn on the screen, you get a notification about that. You can still ignore it if it's okay for you to have that, but um, you want to get notified, notified about unforeseen stuff that's happening. And of course, there are some products out there, um, actually quite a lot, that do that for you. Uh, usually these are pixel-based because um, it's very easy to implement pixel-based whitelist comparison and um, very fast. 
And the problem is, um, of course, if you use different, uh, you know, OSs or different um, underlying uh, versions of, of whatever, the browser or something, then you get differences. But also, um, you usually, you only, you not only have one test, but a couple of them. And if you change the same thing, then all of the tests that are affected will, uh, will turn red, right? So um, you then have the problem to update the expected. And if you think about that, that's actually pretty interesting because usually that helps us. Like if you do version control with source code, um, this means that you don't need to, like if you do code review, you don't need to review all of the code. Like, you know, without version control, you wouldn't know what, what, what was changed. So if you do code review, you would review like 100 million lines of code. Nobody would do that. Um, but because you know what changed, you can have a look only what changed. And um, whitelisting gives you the same. So with whitelisting, um, you just see, you just have a look at all the tests and then you see what changed. But of course, like with Git, you want um, semantic comparison. Like, uh, so this, this is actually uh, comparable to um, if you check in a blob into Git, like a, a binary file. Then Git, you know, you have merge conflicts, you have, um, uh, you, you don't know, like if it's a large file, you don't know what changed in that file actually. So it's, it's quite ugly. Um, but if you do a semantic comparison, then you can say, okay, I want to accept that. And then um, this is very easy. And there are tools for that as well, like approval test and text test, which means that you can, um, so they turn things into text and then compare the text, which also makes it easy to ignore stuff. And um, we also created um, a, um, a framework for that. So this is something we, we are like actively developing right now, uh, which I wanted to point you to. And it's a re we call it recheck because it checks the whole website. And instead of creating assertions, you now need to only say check driver and the whole website is checked. And yeah, this, this is like a whitelisting, whitelist-based testing, gold master-based testing. And it's got another advantage, which means that usually um, if something changes, you can't find it, right, anymore. Like if you have a label on the, on the button and you want to click the button and the label changes, your test breaks. Um, but here we use uh, multiple locators anyway because we do whitelisting. So the redundancy can be reused within the test Actually, it's even better because um, we can make a one-on-one -on -one assignment, a one-on-one -on -one comparison. You, usually, you only know that there's a button called accept. And when you, can't, when you can't find the button that's called accept, then you don't know what to do. But if you know um, the whole page, then you can make a one-on-one -on -one assignment and find that the only button that sensibly would, be, would have been the accept button is now the save button. And you can still identify that and still continue with the test. So in code, you, it looks like that. So this is something we're currently, um, that's not released yet. So this is the hot stuff, so to say. Um, so you use a, a recheck driver um, that wraps your original driver. And then if the ID changes, like if, if you don't have the intro ID anymore on the website, um, instead of a test breakage, you get uh, such a lock uh, message that says, okay, look, um, the, the ID that we were looking for doesn't exist anymore, but we found another element that's probably the element that you've been looking for, and if you apply the changes, then your test will break. So this gives you a possibility to, to um, more easily um, maintain your test, which means that the, uh, the benefits of ReCheck is that reduce the effort to create tests, effort to maintain tests, tests are more complete because you do whitelist testing, and they are less fragile. Okay, but I got a bit sidetracked here, as you probably recognized. We wanted to talk about how to bring AI into testing. Well, actually, I was talking about that because the problem that we need to solve is the Oracle problem. That's keeping AI from, you know, being applied to testing. And the Oracle problem is a problem that looks like that. You can't get to India if the world is flat. But if the world is round, it's no problem. To get there, you can even discover new um, new continents. So what I want to say is that if you want to apply AI to testing, you have to th you have to adapt. Um, you have to think about what you actually want to achieve. Because if you want to, you know, if you if you want um, to build a ship that can swim like a fish, 
and then you have to abstract about what a fish is actually doing. And then you can come up with a submarine, which is very different from a fish, but it, it, do, it achieves the same goal. You know, it can, it can go underwater and swim long distances. And if you want to fly like a bird, then, you know, creating uh, wings with feathers is actually not a good idea. And a plane is very different from a bird, like very different, but it does the same thing. It gives you the ability to fly. And with AI, it's the same thing. So you can't just say, oh, I've got AI and I want to apply it to testing just like that. That doesn't work. So you have to think about how you can achieve the same goal that you, that you achieve with testing while doing things differently. So, um, one possibility um, to actually test your stuff is using the, the monkey theorem. So you probably heard about the infinite monkey theorem. It says, if a monkey is hitting keys at random on a typewriter for a long enough time, then eventually it will um, create the complete works of Shakespeare. And what we do now is we replace the typewriter with a computer and that, le that let the monkey test for you. And now I brought a monkey with me. So don't be afraid, that's a monkey. <laughs> um, and as you can see, it's just 16 lines of code and it works. So you can use that to test your software, whatever that software is. So I'm, I'm showing it now with a website. As you can see, the mouse is moving frantically and um, it's clicking everywhere and it's creating input. And um, as you see, it's, it's testing the application. And it, this works for whatever application you have. Like if you have a 3D action shooter or Eclipse or whatever your software is, you can use that code example and let it run, uh, run for a long enough time, like for two, three hours, and it will, fi it will find you bugs. That's guaranteed. So after long enough time, it will find you bugs. It will create a crash. It will bring your software down. I can guarantee that. The problem is that um, it's hard so it has a few issues, though. Um, once your software crashes, it can't tell you what it did. So it can't tell you, I clicked this button and that button and this button and crashed your software. So you have to, you have to um, find out by, by your log or by whatever um, diagnostic uh, information you usually have with, with uh, users. And other stuff, like you can't train it. Like if you need to log in into your software, that, that monkey doesn't know how to log in. And uh, here in that case, we tested a website, and as you can see, we clicked an external link, which means that we're now not testing our you know, web software anymore, but the internet, which is probably something that um, should be done at some point, but not by us. And um, it's also, it's taking time, right? So it's, you can, I mean, it's very cheap. So if you have a spare computer, you can, you know, let just run, let it just run like that. And um, after a couple of hours, you get your crashes but it's not, it's, it's not effective, uh, not efficient, sorry. But there are open source products for that. For instance, Gremlins, which is a um, JavaScript library, Netflix has the Chaos Monkey, and if you happen to um, develop um, apps, then there's an application from Google, UI Application Exerciser Monkey, which you can use to uh, yeah, monkey test your application. Okay, but this is not, like, um, this solves the problem. Like, in eternity, this will totally test your software in completeness. Okay, so this already solves the problem. It's just not efficient. And it's not intelligent, frankly. So um, how can we make that more efficient by making the monkey more intelligent? Like, that probably. Um, I brought in, well, what we do is we introduce context. So I brought another monkey, which is now um, implemented in Selenium, and which means that you can you know, you can't test your action, uh, 3D action shooter or Eclipse anymore. You can just test your web application. But again, this is working code. You can try it at home. And what it does is just like before, it clicks on a random link and inputs some random stuff into, into uh, input fields. And if I um, let this run, then you see the mouse is not moving anymore because it's inside of the browser. And now um, this is much easier to, to adapt. Now you can say, okay, if I'm on the login site, these are valid credentials. Um, if I'm on an external site, go back, start over. If I, for instance, 
Um, if you want to know how did the crash occur, you can say, okay, what did you actually do? You can create a lock. So I, cl I clicked this button, I clicked that button, I did, you know, input that stuff into that field, stuff like that. And it, again, it will give you crashes. Okay, so this is, this is the first thing that you can do, but it's still not intelligent, right? So if you, for instance, if you have a, an input uh, screen that looks like that, and um, then you have a lot of implicit um, dependencies. So you have like, you know, this value has to be a certain, a certain uh, value that, that this value is valid. For instance, you need an, an email address or a valid date or stuff like that. So doing that completely random will still you not give you that. Or if you have a very long running uh, process, like if you, if you have a long user uh, story or something, then it's probably, it might t still take a while until the monkey will do that for you. So how can we make that like really intelligent? And now I have an analog analogy. Um, so right now um, everybody's talking about autonomous cars and how to you know, create autonomous driving. And if you do that completely visual, then what you need to do here is you need to understand where are the lanes, where are obstacles, where are um, signs that I need to, that, that express rules that I need to follow, like how fast can I go, where can I turn, stuff like that. And um, there are th six traffic lights in the picture, and I need to find out which traffic light is for me on the lane that I'm at, uh, that I'm at, and what what color has it. And all of that in real time, because it doesn't help you if you say, oh, two minutes ago there was a red light and I crossed it. Uh, and frankly, we can do that today. So our our hardware, uh, like I don't know um, right now, but uh, two, one year ago when I when I uh, created that slide, it was not possible. So if it if you have a problem that's just too big to be solved by you, what you can do is um, you break it up and you create a uh, you solve a smaller problem. And what Google did is uh, you probably heard about Google Street Map. So what they did is they, they had this car drive around and make in tons of, of photos and, and imagery and analyze that offline with the Google Cloud. So with as much computing power as they needed for as long as they needed. And um, then it's much easier because then you know already what rules there are. You know how fast you may go, in which direction you can turn, whether you can overtake or not, stuff like that. And... Um, you also, and so like in that picture, you already know the lanes, you, you, you know that there are six, um, probably six um, traffic lights, so you just need, and you know which, which one is for you and where roughly in the picture it should be. That's much easier. So you just need to avoid obstacles, find the traffic light and find out whether it's red, green or yellow. And that we can do even today. Going back to our software problem, this means that um, if you have a complex um, user scenario like that, and it's too complex for the monkey to find out on its own, then what you can do is you can train it once. So you can give it a rough um, impression of how your software works, just by, doing, by giving it just one example, one valid user credential, one, you know, walking it through the happy path once, so that it gets a rough mapping of how your software works. And then what it can do for you uh, the longer and the more complex that, uh, that user scenario is and that happy path is, then the more, um, the more um, exceptions there are. Like you want to test what happens if someone orders a thousand items or minus one item or um, the uh, delivery date is in two years or was last year or stuff like that. Or if he in between goes back and forth and goes back again. Um, so you, you want to test all of that stuff eventually and that is something that the monkey, that the AI can do for you. You just need to give it one example, how the software roughly works so that it gets a rough uh, understanding and then it can, it can work with that and um, yeah, change that, mutate that. And it can even be better than, um, than manual testing at that point because for instance, so if you do white box based testing, if you do like a coverage analysis, and give the coverage to the to the AI and say increase my coverage, then it might even um, even even be able to to improve on the manual testing. Because if you, for instance, have a date field where you say, okay, here's a valid birth date, and in the specification it says we just you know persist that and and use it later, but it's not making a difference in the in the flow, 
but it actually makes a difference, which the manual tester is not aware of, but because of the coverage information that the AI has, it realizes that different values in that field actually make a difference, which means that um, the AI can create better tests than a manual tester would be able to. And um, so what we do is, um, what, what you can do is you can combine different um, methods of AI, like, uh, art, like a genetic algorithm um, helps you do what I just said, that you give it a rough uh, user story, a rough golden um, a happy path that it can work with and mutate and, and uh, change. And you also give it, you can give it an artificial neural network because what we found is that um, if you do, um, like software is not created randomly, right? There are underlying UI principles, which fields go next to each other, uh, where, where do you put the buttons, uh, in which order, what, what like they uh, hint at what the button would possibly do. And that's stuff that is not specific for individual software but um, is, is broader, like UI principles apply to most of software. And you can use an uh, artificial neural network and train how typical UI principles work within software and create, um, you know, teach the monkey how to typically use software. And at the top of that, as I said, um, put your specific use cases. So this means that yeah, the user, oh sorry, the user or the um, developer or the tester can train the AI to come up with good um, test cases. And there's already, this is already being done. So this is not the future, this is um, current state. So for instance at Facebook they have this project called Fa uh, Sapiens where they do just that. Again it's app, app testing internally in Facebook, so this is not a product you can buy, um, but they are doing this at scale. Like for every Facebook app um, they have an AI test that application and because of the Oracle problem um, right now only um, what it does is find only crashes. So if you if they test a Facebook app with Sapiens they check for exceptions like null pointer exceptions, technical stuff and you know find that kind of stuff. But um, with what I introduced earlier with a recheck uh, framework um, or any other golden master framework, what you could do instead would be to have a user test the application manually because of the Oracle problem. You need one manual test. So um, for instance, with version 1.0, you would uh, do a manual test. And at the same time, you can record what is happening and even uh, have at that time uh, train your uh, AI how your software works, how the manual tester is going, is, is um, testing your software. And then you can use that to automate tests. Automate tests like doing um, golden master based testing. And then if you have the next version of the software, you, you get shown what, what changes, right? You see, okay, this is what we had before. This is what we have now. There's a difference. And then again, you need a manual, because of the Oracle problem, you need a manual user or manual tester, um, have a look at the differences and say, okay, this is actually what we wanted. Like we, we switched that button from green to red and that wasn't a mistake, that was on purpose. That's not a side effect. This is what we wanted. And this is how you can bring um, AI into testing. Actually, you can go one step further even, um, which is what they do at Facebook right now again is um, having so test generation allows you to also um, create automatically fixes like if you have a, um, a technical problem like a null pointer exception user, usually the fix is like two lines of code right so if null return some, something like that like easy fixes um, and um, Facebook created a tool that applies those fixes to their code. So you give it an application, the AI tests it, it finds a technical problem, it comes up with a fix for that problem, and because you have so many tests that make sure that you know, all the other stuff is still working, you can come up with multiple tests and uh, multiple fixes, apply them and see what changes. And if nothing changes except for your crash, for your technical problem to go away, then this is a valid fix. So you can automatically apply the fix to the software. And this is what's being done. 
And if you think about that, so this is, this is the start, right? This is the beginning. Um, so essentially, when it comes to AI in testing and AI in software generation, this is where we are. Like, this was the internet 20 years ago. This was uh, one of the very first web pages. It was statically, it was ugly, um, didn't work very well. But the internet turned out to be, you know, just great. And I think what we see here is just that. What we see here is the very first start, very rough, very ugly, very, you know, um, uh, just hinting at what's possible. Because in a way, what, what, what we would want is to create a text like prose text or an explanation of what we want and have AI generate a model from that and generate a source code or generate the software for us. Like this is what we might see in, I don't know, 20 years. Like for easy software, for, for crude, like for uh, create, record, um, update, delete software, where it's just about data, not like not about complex stuff, but um, like 80% of the software that's out there, like CRM, SAP, ERP systems, stuff like that. Um, this is what you could use. This is what you could do. Tell the, soft tell the AI what you want and have the AI uh, generate the software for you. And I think um, the very first start to do that is not, is because um, a test right now, like a Selenium test, also is code. A test right now also is software on its own, right? So what we do when we generate tests is actually the very first start of generating software. Just that our, um, our specification is not text or uh, documentation, but is existing software. And we derive meaning from that existing software and generate a test for that software. So, as I said, I think this is a very first start on, on what will be a journey into essentially uh, generating software with AI. Okay, now I was a bit faster than I expected. <laughs> um, so this is already um, kind of the summary of my talk. I can uh, give, if you're interested, I will give a short demo of the, um, the open source tool that we created for Golden Master Tested, for white box uh, testing of websites. Um, afterwards, um, but this is not exactly AI, so th I will do that after the talk. Um, so, are there questions right now? Okay, no questions? Then I'll just continue and uh, do a short demo of the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, also you can find... So, I will update the, uh, upload the slides uh, to SlideShare, and if you, like, have a look at Twitter, um, um, I will post the link there, so you can find the slides um, like tomorrow or something. And right now I want to show you what we have. So, okay, let's see. Oh no, wrong one. So, so this is a typical Selenium test. Um, and what we did is um, we um, added our uh, implementation. So this is on Maven Central. Um, it's open source. You can just um, include it in your POM and, and use it. And um, so this is um, still beta. Like this is version 05 or something. So this is not, not production ready yet. It's, uh, we are still, um, you know, kinking out the edges. But um, I will show you how that works. Um, at some point, you just, as I said, you just call re uh, check, which means that, and you give it the driver, which means that, you can see that, okay, even bigger, so, which means that it will now check everything on the web page there is. It will check the complete web page at once and will show you changes um, if you, you know, uh, have the next version. And um, um, if you use, for instance, um, an ID to, to find your to element to click on or something. Um, if that ID changes, your test usually will break. So I will just run that, that test. So 
Um, everything is green, so um, which means that um, the pe the website didn't change, and now I can use another website which did change, and as you can see here, for instance, that ID that was changed into another ID. The class was removed. Um, the the X path was changed. Um, that class was removed. So we did we did um, here we we have both like um, changing the xpath and removing stuff. And now um, we want to find an element with that ID and there is no such element anymore on the page because we changed that ID. And if we run that uh, test, ah, damn it, I forgot something. So if I run that test, Sorry, um, it's green, which means that it still passes. The test um, um, gives me, like, it still finds um, the elements, and now it shows what changed, right? And on the console, as you can see here, I can make that bigger. No, I can't. Oh, can you read it anyway? Um, so it gives you that, that warning that I showed you, saying that before there was um, an ID or a class name or something that you used to identify your element within the test, and that information is now gone in the live version, but because we have the golden master and can make that one-on-one -on -one assignment of elements, we can still find that element in your test and can say, um, look, you need to change your test for instance, you need to use that different ID. So now your element has a different ID. You need to use a new ID in order to maintain the test. Otherwise, if you apply the changes to the golden master, your test will fail the next, uh, the next round. So I'd be happy if anyone uh, was interested in that. And you can try it, um, as I said, it's, um, it's open source. So you can try it and give us feedback, and we'd love that. So, uh, thanks for your time. <laughs>